Human dignity is a central concept in Islam. It is rooted in its primary sources, the Quran and Sunnah. It is a concept which is universal in its scope, comprehensive, and justly balanced in its nature and practical in its application. As we see, inshallah, from the next uh, slide, the presentation begins by articulating a little bit on this universal nature of the concept. And then the remaining part of the presentation would be largely an application of that alongside the five basic objectives of Sharia, ah, namely safeguarding faith, life, mind, honor, and property, we end, inshallah, with a brief conclusion. On the issue of universality, <coughs> by the universal nature of human dignity as a concept in Islam, we mean that it is not restricted or limited by virtue of race, color, nationality, gender, or even religion insofar as humanity is concerned. Rather, it is a concept that embraces all human beings on the globe. To articulate a little bit on this characteristic, let's look at four examples of that universal nature. The first one, that the human is created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first of all, fi ahsani taqweem, in the best of molds. The best of mold can be looked at in three subways, sub areas. One, it is the best mold physically. This is as one aspect of dignity that Allah gave to the human. As the Quran says, Alam wa Haven't we given the human two eyes, a tongue, and a pair of lips? In Surah Al-Infitar, Allah created the human, created you, fashioned you, and made you in the best of molds. It is also best mold intellectually, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described his blessings on us. Allah gave you the faculties of hearing, sight, and thinking also, or understanding. Reference here apparently is made to the power of reasoning, or as Muhammad Asad calls it, conceptual thinking. That's one of the gifts of Allah. This relates to the knowledge of the names or nature of all things that Allah taught to Adam as obvious from his dialogue with the angels in Surah Al-Baqarah. The first revelation given to the Prophet وسلم, reminds us of the honor bestowed on the human by Allah who taught writing by the pen. Whatever the human feels or learns through conceptual thinking or writing is possible to communicate, not like other beings by barking, meowing, or braying, but by bayan, allamahu al-bayan. Allah taught us the power of expression. Speaking of this gift that Allah gave to us, Imam Qurtubi, one of the famous commentators on the Quran, described the mind in the following terms, and allow me to quote him in Arabic first. He said that the mind is umdatu taklif wa bihi yu'rafullah وَيُفْهَمُ كَلَامُهُ وَيُوصَلُ إِلَى نَعِيمِهِ وَتُصَدَّقُ رُسُلُهُ فَالشَّرْعُ كَالشَّمْسِ وَالْعَيْنُ وَالْعَقْلُ كَالْعَيْنِ إِنْ كَانَتْ سَلِيمَةً رَأَتِ الشَّمْسَ وَأَدْرَكَتِ الْأَشْيَاءِ Basically, he says that the mind is the foundation of responsibility or accountability. Through it, Allah is recognized through the mind. 
and known. His words are understood. His bliss is attained and his messengers are followed. Sharia is like the sun and the mind is like the eye. If the eye is healthy, it would be able to see the sun and be aware of things, means things around it. In addition to the human being in the best mold physically and intellectually, another important element that he is also, he or she, is in the best mold spiritually, at least insofar as the way Allah gave him or her the fitrah. The only creature about whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِي and breathed into him something of my spirit is the human being. <coughs> it is that divine breath in every human being which explains the natural, pure, innate knowledge of good and evil described in the Quran, وَهَدَيْنَاهُ najdain. We guided the human the two ways, means the, the correct way and the wrong way. The human knows that innately. The second aspect of that universal nature of the Islamic concept of human dignity is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dignified and honored the human being by commanding the angels to bow down to Adam. This is not bowing of worship, this is bowing of respect. Bowing to worship is only to Allah. <coughs> and when Iblis, the chief Satan, refused, Allah tells him, ما منعك أن تسجد لما خلقت بيدي What prevented you from bowing down to what I created with my own hands? With my own hands. In a hadith narrated by uh, in Ibn Asakir on Anas ibn Malik radiallahu an is when the Prophet said that the angels remembered or recounted what Allah has given to the human but not to the angels. The ability to eat food, drink, dress, marriage, having means of transportation like riding camels and so on. And Allah responded to them, I'm not going to make the creature that I created with my own hands and breathed into him something of my spirit as the other creature that I simply created by saying be, and it is. The third aspect of universality <coughs> is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the human his trustee on earth, carrying the trust and responsibility which is described in the Quran as a trust from which the heavens, the earth, and mountains shied away. The fourth aspect is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala subjected to the human everything in heavens and on earth, including cosmic laws for the benefit of the human. The ayat in the Quran are too numerous to count. No wonder then that we find inclusive terms used in the Quran to refer to human dignity. As we read in Surah Al-Isra, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ Indeed, Allah says, we conferred dignity or honor on the children of Adam and we carried them over land and sea and provided them with sustenance out of the good things of life and we favored them above a good portion of our creatures. Some may wonder at the conclusion of that concept of universality, however. How could such honor and dignity be universal so as to include even those who rejected faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or associated others with him in his exclusive divine attributes? In answering that question, it is important that we make a distinction between two different things. One is acceptance by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and achieving bliss and salvation in the hereafter. 
which comes only from believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on one hand. On the other, the entitlement of other human beings, even those who reject Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be treated and dignified as human beings. And these two are totally different. So far we spoke only about the universality of the concept of human dignity in Islam. The remaining presentation, as indicated earlier, will be an attempt to use the five major and famous objectives of Sharia ah as the frame of reference within which other characteristics of the concept of human dignity in Islam, such as comprehensiveness, just balance, and practicality, can be examined. We begin with the first and most important objective of Sharia, ah, safeguarding of faith. The dignity and honor conferred on the human being in this category can be categorized at least in seven categories. First, the dignity and honor by giving us the true, pure, innate nature which, if uncorrupted, will be responsive to faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what the Quran described as fitrat Allah allati fatar al nasa alayhi. This is the pure innate nature that Allah created the humans accordingly. That is what was echoed by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that every child is born Muslim, every child. It is only his parents who make him Jew, Christian, Magian, or what not. So every child is born naturally Muslim. Secondly, <laughs> the divine favor of sending prophets and messengers to guide the human being and to purify them. And as the Quran described the mission of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةِ There are more than one ayah that he recite the signs of Allah, the ayat, purifies them and teach them. As such, the destiny of the human is related to the extent of his or her ability to engage in self-purification. As Allah reminds us in the Quran, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا Successful is he or she who purifies his or her soul and the loser is the one who corrupted. Thirdly, the divine command that Allah has given, that we never bow down and submit fully to any other than Him. Those who disdain from bowing to their Creator think that they are liberated. In fact, they are enslaved, not liberated. Because when we refuse to bow down to Allah and worship Him, as humans we are tempted to bow down and worship something else, false gods. These false gods could be chiefs, persons, friends, social values. And a person even who thinks that he's totally liberated because he refuses to bow down to Allah or even to any of these people, assume even for the sake of argument he doesn't, he's still bowing down and being enslaved to his own nafs and hawa. The Quran considers nafs as a false god. Have you seen him or her who took for his god their own whims? So one is bowing down actually to his whims if he thinks that he's liberated from following Allah. It is even degrading, we can say, to refuse to bow down to Allah and, de and bow down to something less than that, more degrading even when the human being bows down to creatures which Allah created for the benefit of mankind, such as objects of nature or animals. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ اللَّيْلُ وَالنَّهَارُ وَالشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمَرِ لَا تَسْجُدُوا لِلشَّمْسِ وَلَا لِلْقَمَرِ وَاسْجُدُوا لِلَّهِ الَّذِي خَلَقَهُنَّ إِن كُنْتُمْ إِيَّاهُ تَعْبُدُونَ 
of the signs of Allah is the creation of heavens and earth and the sun and the moon bow down not to the sun or the moon but bow down to the one who created them if, in, in, if indeed you know this dignity also lies in being a responsible being accepting the consequences and responsibility for our choices our moral choices and our actions another aspect of human dignity is to respect the right of the human to believe or not to believe that the person could not be forced to accept a religion against their own choices the ayat are quite plentiful la ikraha fi din there is no let be no compulsion in religion Say truth is from your Lord, then whoever wills, let him believe, and whoever wills, let him reject faith. A fifth aspect of that, no, still there, is the right of the individual not only to believe or reject faith, but also to practice peacefully whatever rights or religious duties according to their own religions. In the Quran, in Surah Al-Hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described that had it not been that Allah checks the tyranny or power of one group of people by means of others, places of worship would have been destroyed. And it mentioned first monasteries, synagogues, churches, and then even after that it mentions mosques. So that if Muslims indeed are the ones in power, they should show extra sensitivity in safeguarding the places of worship of others, even before their own, since they are already in power. Even in the matter of acts of worship, at least from an Islamic perspective, we find a great deal of dignity also that Allah has given us. For in the acts of worship, when we make ablution or bathe, we get used to cleanliness, cleanliness of body, clothes, and place of prayers, modesty of clothes, and dignity also, and grace in our clothes. It doesn't have to be clumsy. Modest, but also graceful. As Allah says, take your adornment every time you go for the prayers. The sixth aspect, to maintain the dignity also of the human and to teach Muslims also not to cause other people to commit acts of ignorance against them. The Quran made it forbidden to curse the false gods that others are worshipping. Except of course for what was absolutely necessary like Prophet Ibrahim telling his people that those idols have no benefit or harm to you. But other than that, we read in the Quran, وَلَا تَسُبُّوا الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيَسُبُّوا اللَّهَ عَدْوًا بِغَيْرِ عَلْمٍ Don't abuse those false gods that people worship instead of Allah, so that you provoke them, means provoke them to curse or abuse the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The final one is to accept pluralism, because that's part of respect of human dignity. Pluralism even in religions. But not necessarily to accept what other people believe other than Islam because in Adina and Allah is Islam. There is no argument. The true religion in the sight of Allah is Islam. But it's for Allah to judge people who accept or reject. But so long as those humans are living on earth, there is a basis in the Quran for accepting religious pluralism even in a dominant society or a Muslim dominated society. There are numerous indications of that in the Quran. If your Lord willed, all people on earth would have been believers. If Allah willed, He would have made you all one nation. In another, in Surah Al-Ma'idah, So hasten in doing good deeds. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala willed and decreed that even though He knows Islam is the true way, that still some people will not accept it or hear of it and there will be diversity of religions wrong as they might be from our perspective 
if, it, if that is his will, who are we to try to force people and say there is no pluralism, we have to have an exclusivist society that has only room for Muslims. It has never been the case, and the Sharia rules in dealing with the rights of non-Muslims under an Islamic State is a manifestation of pluralism and a proof that this is not really a modern 20th century concept. It is ingrained and founded in the Quran. Taking the second objective of Sharia, safeguarding life, six basic points I need, I'd like to make. First of all, there could be no human dignity if there is no recognition of sanctity of human life. And the Quran is quite clear on that. Don't take away the life or the nafs, the soul that Allah made sanctified except بالحق, in truth that is for due, due cause and also mean implies with due course of law. The Quran speaks about what Allah revealed to previous prophets in the past, confirming it again. That anyone who kills a single soul, not for retaliation or punishment like capital murder for a murderer, or corrupt, spreading corruption on earth, he is like one who killed all humanity. And anyone who sa saves a single soul, he is like one who saved the life or souls of all mankind. <coughs> Secondly, sanctity of life includes as well the life of the vulnerable as represented by small infants. That's why the Quran forbade the cruel practice of female infanticide either because of a present poverty or for fear of future poverty. Both are mentioned in the Quran. Thirdly, it goes on even to protect the life of the fetus, especially after the ruh has been breathed into it, which I believe is perhaps around the 40th day, not after three months as some thought. And to protect that fetus from modern infanticide called abortion. This is the modern day infanticide, not only for females, but for males as well. Fourthly, the dignity of sanctifying life also forbids that a person kills himself even, or herself. Suicide is forbidden and punishable in the Day of Judgment. Don't kill yourselves. Allah indeed is merciful to you. Fifthly, it includes even the respect of life of innocent people even in the enemy's camp, as we find in the instruction of the Prophet and his companions after him, even in legitimate warfare, not killing a woman who's not fighting, a child, an old man, a civilian farmer who's tending uh, to his farm, a clergy who's not fighting, let alone forbidding even cutting trees or killing animals for no reason except destruction. But there are also measures to make sure that life is to be respected, including the punishment of the murderer who aggresses against the life of another human being, the right of self-defense, as well as fighting against oppression, including oppression that prevents the message of Islam from peacefully reaching other people in fulfillment of the historic duty and mission of Muslims as the final and universal message to all of mankind. And all of these are documented as well in the Quran. We had, would like to add to this that when we examine the true and pure teaching of Islam from its original and primary sources, we find that it has nothing to do with any random act of violence, whatever it's called, terrorism or whatnot, but the definition of terrorism must include not only terrorism committed by individuals or groups, but the more dangerous type of terrorism committed by states, contrary to international law, 
and contrary to UN Charter, just taking the law in their own hands. This is a more serious form of terrorism and provokes more terrorism and continue that unfortunate cycle of violence. The third objective of Sharia, to safeguard the mind. We spoke earlier about the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of giving us reason and understanding. In order to enhance and properly use that gift of Allah, at least three things may be relevant here. First of all, that we are obligated to use that Allah-given dignity to reflect upon the creation of Allah and that is regarded as an act of worship. Numerous ayat in the Quran, قُلْ انظُرُوا مَاذَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Say, O Muhammad Wasallam, look as to what is there in heavens and earth, not just on earth, in heavens and earth. أَوَلَمْ يَنظُرُوا إِلَى السَّمَاءِ فَوْقَهُمْ كَيْفَ بَنَيْنَاهَا وَزَيَّنَّاهَا وَمَا لَهَا مِنْ فُرُوجِ Have they not looked in the skies or the heavens above them how we constructed it or built it, created it, adorned أَفَلَا يَنظُرُونَ إِلَى الْإِبْلِ كَيْفَ خُلِقَتْ Don't they look at the camels, how they are created? All creation is for us to ponder around and look. And that's an act of worship if we have the correct intention when we examine them. In fact, the Quran chastises those who are unmindful about the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Blind of the signs that are all around them. Look at this ayah in the Quran. وَكَأَيِّمْ مِنْ آيَةٍ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ يَمُرُّونَ عَلَيْهَا وَهُمْ عَنْهَا مُعْرِضُونَ How many a sign in heavens and earth that they pass by and they are just unmindful of, they turn away from. There is no philosophy in Islam as it existed in the past. That reason is the enemy of faith and that they are like two, the thesis and the antithesis of one another. On the contrary, faith and reason are all gifts from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if used properly, they have to meet. There is no sin reflecting and thinking, especially in the area or scope of the human mind. Ghaibiyas, the unseen, is left to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our human minds cannot fully comprehend. But other than that, the Quran gives a carte blanche to reflect. That's part of dignity. Secondly, to consider the pursuit of knowledge a religious duty, not right. As the Prophet ﷺ say, seeking knowledge is mandatory duty. A mandatory duty on every Muslim, generically means Muslim male and female. Thirdly, safeguarding the mind <coughs> from any destructive or corruptive elements, such as alcohol, drugs, listening to evil musics and evil lyrics, and a lot of people know what I mean, and watching evil things. Because these are not just bad in themselves, they are also mind-corrupting, mind twisting, if you will. Suffice to watch a heavily intoxicated person staggering in the street, uttering what he or she will be awfully ashamed to know when they are sober, or committing an act which may destroy their own lives and those of others, like the highway accidents. Fourthly, safeguarding honor Traditionally, this category was understood by scholars to refer to one crucial aspect of honor, the safeguarding of progeny or sexual morality, if you will. However, if we look carefully into the broader meaning of dignity, it would not be difficult to document it from the Quran itself. At least nine points can be narrated here. First of all, Allah dignified the human by teaching us 
that the instinctive desire to relate to the other gender is not something that a person should feel guilty or bad about it, that this is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all know the people who thought that they can get closer to Allah by not marrying or fasting all the time or praying all the time and the Prophet say, I am the most fearful of you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm the most righteous. However, I pray and I sleep, I fast and I break the fast and I also get married. And this makes the attitude toward this natural things healthy. It's a, it's a bounty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran describes this yearning of the genders towards each other in Surah Al-Rum. Of the signs of Allah that he created for you from your same nature, same souls, spouses, that you might find peace and tranquility in them. And he ordained between your hearts love and compassion, not feeling of guilt. So that emphasizes human dignity in marital relationship. The Quran also speaks about children and grandchildren as a bounty from him. So that emphasizes human dignity in the relationship between parents and children. But then the Quran goes beyond the nucleus family as defined in the West to speak about the rights of relatives. And as such, you get the human dignity in the relationship within the extended family. But to protect or in return for acknowledging this human need, Things had been forbidden and restricted, not to make our life miserable or restricted, but to purify our lives, to protect it. Like adultery, fornication, prostitution, and all other vices that indeed has nothing to do with liberation or dignity, they are the worst degrading acts that a human being can fall in. Another element, second one, relating to honor, is to protect and safeguard the chastity of women and the inviolability of their reputation and sexual morality. Not only by prohibiting rape, but even prohibiting slander and providing in the Quran for a specific punishment for anyone accusing an honorable woman and her dearest thing, her honor. Thirdly, in the area of social relationship, dignity is also conferred on people that we deal with in society. You go through the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, and for shortness of time, just giving capsulized presentation, you find a hadith about ikram al daif dignifying and honoring your guest, honoring your neighbor, which according to the Quran and hadith as well, a neighbor even who may not necessarily be a Muslim. Waljari al Qurba, Waljari al Junub, Wal Sahib al Jam, even a casual neighbor in a transport in a means of transportation is also to be honored. To honor and deal justly and kindly with the people of the book in particular who are not fighting against Muslims or driving them out of their homes. Even to dignify anyone in general from any religion that deals with Muslims in mutual respect and honor. Fourthly, a human dignity has been reflected in the Quran also by giving every human being the right to move around the earth, the freedom of movement. Allah created you the earth to be subservient to you. Walk. That's a right that's given by Allah. Nobody has the right to restrict, except, of course, for very rare cases. But the basic rule, everybody is free to move around. Fifthly, the right to privacy. That's one aspect of dignity. In the Quran, we are told not to enter homes other than our own until we seek permission and make sure it's convenient. The Quran in Surah Al-Hujurat forbade us from spying on one another. Number six, to be free from insult and harassment. And look at this ayah in Surah Al-Hujurat. You must have heard it a lot, but there is one particular word that interests me. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la yaskhar qawmun min qawmin asa an yakunu khayran minhu. O believers, don't let a group of people 
make mockery of another. And he says qawm. He did not say qawm in muslimin. He doesn't just speak about Muslims. Speak about people in general. That if you're a true mu'min, you should not engage in makari and insult and harassment against other people, qawm, whether they are Muslims or not. The Prophet wasallam taught us not to backbite, not to have bad intention attributed to people's actions without evidence. And as we speak about this evil of harassment of others, an insult of others. Obviously, one of the greatest insults against the dignity of human being is to harass them, discriminate against them, or mock at them because of the natural diversity that Allah has created by virtue of their languages, the color of their skins, their ethnic group, or their gender even, for that matter. Seven. Equality with others, not only equality among Muslims. And we find that clear again in using the term an-nas, ya ayyuha nas O people, not O believers or O Muslims. We find the address in Surah An-Nisa, the fourth surah of the Quran. اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء. O people, O mankind, Muslims and others. Be dutiful to your Lord who created you from a single soul and of like nature he created its mate and of both of them he scattered multitudes of men and women. We find it in Surah Al-Hujurat, Surah 49, in Ayah 13. يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ إِنَّا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْثَىٰ وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُوا إِلَىٰ آخِرِ الْآيَةِ O mankind, not O Muslims, again. We created you from a single pair of a male and female. Some translate male and female. So there is no distinction between genders. They're all created by Allah. They have one family, having the same parenthood. And then we made you into nations and tribes that you may get to know and recognize one another. And then it cuts at the roots of this false superiority by any other pretense, as we have seen, are seeing, and probably will continue to see around the world, the evil of superiority based on uh, man-made criteria. Inna akramakum Allahi atqakum. The most honored of you in the sight of Allah is one who is most righteous. The eighth element of honor is that this equality cannot work unless there is an attempt to establish justice, the universal concept of justice in Islam that is described in Surah Al-Hadid, Surah 57, as one important aspect of the mission of all prophets. Allah sent these prophets, gave them the balance of right and wrong, the book, the scriptures. Why? So people will stand up for justice. Not just to wait for the justice in the hereafter. Ultimate justice will be in the hereafter. But respect of human dignity requires to try to remove the suffering of human beings here and now who are suffering from injustice and look around the Muslim world how many categories of those Muslims are suffering and how much Muslims are depicted in the media as the victim, as, as the villains rather than the victims as they are. It is the same justice that has been described in the Quran as a duty and a command to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and a command to all believers in Allah ya'muru bil adli wal ihsan Allah demands justice and goodness from us the Quran demands that this justice should not be affected by relationship or personal agendas walaw ala anfusikum aw al walidayn wa aqrib say do justice even if it's against your own interest or those of your close relatives. Even justice with the enemy. Imagine that. Don't let the hatred of other people to you, your enemies even. Don't let that hatred dissuade you from doing justice. Do justice because that is closer to piety. One aspect of that justice we should not forget is to strive for economic justice. 
because that is obviously related to human dignity as well. According to the Quran, all the wealth belongs to Allah in the ultimate analysis. We are only trustees of what he gives us in this life. As we see in the Quran, وَأَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا جَعَلَكُمْ مُسْتَخْلَفِينَ فِي Spend of what Allah had made you trustee in it. He appointed you trustees. But the real owner of everything is none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One duty of that istikhlaf, trusteeship, is not to acquire wealth by lying, cheating, and deception, or committing vices. In fact, the duty of economic justice applies not only to those who can take the right by themselves, but more so to the vulnerable and the weak. Look at this ayah in the Quran, which is really amazing. Describing people who will be punished in the hereafter, they will be told, Kalla balla tukrimuna al yatim. No, but you did not honor the orphan. Notice here it didn't say, Kalla balla tutrimuna al yatim. It didn't say, you didn't feed the orphan. It's a concept greater than just feeding or clothing, honoring. You can feed someone in a way that is humiliating. When you feed someone, you're only looking after their physical needs. But the human being is more dignified than that. He's an intellectual being and a spiritual being. And as such, he should not just be feeding as such, but honoring. And who? The weak and the vulnerable in that case the orphan. Not only this, whether you speak about an orphan or adult, if they are entitled for help because of their illness or weakness or old age or whatever, what they are taking from others is not really a charity, but a right. وَالَّذِينَ فِي أَمْوَالِهِمْ حَقٌّ معلوم. Describing true believers as those who have a specified right Right for other needy in their, in their wealth. Look at this ayah in the Quran. Give the relative, and speaks also about the poor, the indigent, and the wayfarer. What? Did they give him a charity? No. Give him his or her right. His or her right to dignify the human because of their weakness from feeling meek before another human because they're supplying them with their needs. But this economic justice should not only be limited to a Muslim community or a Muslim nation. It is even a universal concept. And all the hadith that speak about charity do not necessarily exclude being charitable to people beyond even when it speaks about the right of the wayfarer, which means he may not belong to a particular nation. He could be from any other nation. Showing the broader mercy and compassion that Islam teaches its true followers. One aspect, the final one, of that dignity is the right to participate in the political process. For to remove the right of people to have their say in the administration and governance of their own affairs is to degrade their human dignity as the human dignity of Muslims all over the world are virtually taken away from them by their tyrannical rulers. The final category, safeguarding of property. This is also one aspect of human dignity. Because Allah created the human with that instinct and desire to own property, even if you take it as a trust in your hand, to own property and to dispose of it without any unreasonable and unnecessary restriction. Here again, four points to remind us. One is to dignify the human by acknowledging the right of ownership. So all the totalitarian system that says only the state owns and as Marx once put it, property is theft. See, Marx, Marx once said, property is theft. 
No, property is not theft. It is an instinctive thing. And Allah acknowledges, give us the acknowledgement that it is okay to own property. For men, there is a share of what they earn. Women, they have a share also of what they earn. Secondly, it made it the right of the individual to enjoy wealth, provided that no haram or forbidden is committed and without excesses or waste. Eat and drink, but commit no excesses. The Quran even forbid the person to make halal things haram. Qul man harram Allah. Say who had the right to forbid the adornment and the good provision that Allah made for his servants. Thirdly, to protect wealth. We find specific directives also, including safeguarding the wealth of the orphan, the minor, until he or she grows. Don't come close, means don't commit any aggression. Take away from the wealth of the orphan until they reach maturity. It includes also guardianship on a person who might be an adult, but who is insane. And the Quran describes wealth as not only his wealth, but the wealth of the ummah. Don't give these people who are weak-minded your property, even though it could be owned by them. So guardianship to make sure they don't hurt themselves in society is permissible. It includes the punishment of the person who commit theft, provided, provided that before any punishment is meted, the reasons for theft, social injustice, discrimination, and cruelty must be removed first so that the person will have no need to aggress against the rights, property, and in some cases, life of others in the process of theft. Fourthly, the final one, Islam did not restrict the right of the human to earn a living except in haram, such as cheating or theft. And there is no concept of Sabbath Similar to the Jai Christian traditions, a person can work before or after Jum'ah. It is left up to him, so there is no restriction on earning a living. In conclusion, in the beginning of this reasonably brief presentation, and you forgive me for capsulizing it, when you start giving all quotations, it could take three times as long. We spoke about the most salient characteristic of the concept of human dignity in Islam and it's, that is universality. It's universality and embracive nature for all mankind. The bulk of the presentation, just to remind you, was to point out to some elements of that human dignity organized around the five basic purposes of Sharia, safeguarding faith, life, mind, honor, and property. But throughout that presentation, I hope it is clear also in our mind that one condition of enjoying that human dignity is not to try to deprive other human beings from their human dignity. And as such, a person who is imprisoned or punished for a crime cannot complain that anyone is aggressing against their human dignity because they are paying for not respecting the human dignity of other human beings. In conclusion, I must say that as we come to the close of this presentation, I hope it becomes also clearer in our mind that the Islamic concept of human dignity is not a mere declaration, like all the kind of declaration that you hear. It is something that is based deeply on faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala something that is sanctioned not by law or United Nation or this convention or that convention, but the sanction in terms of fear of the punishment of Allah and the pursuit of his pleasure and for the sake above all of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that it is not just mere theoretical principles, but something that is operational, that Sharia is so comprehensive that it deals 
with the specific measures as to how to enhance and protect that human dignity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all with the highest of all forms of dignity, the dignity of relating to him, knowing him, and loving him. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Zakallahu khair, Sheikh Jabbar Badawi. Uh, inshallah, as you all see that uh, we started just a few minutes late and uh, uh, I've got the speakers panel over here that it is going to be very difficult for me to ask them to shorten their speeches or uh, cut it down. It is, it is going to be very difficult. So I would request every participant, inshallah, to bear with me, inshallah. We will give them enough time so they can share their experiences with us. And inshallah, we can enhance our knowledge in the meantime. And just a reminder, the babysitting service is available. <laughs> uh, to continue with the program, inshallah, uh, I would request uh, Imam Siraj Wahaj to discuss living with courage. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Shadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la. Wa shadu anna muhammadan abduhu rasul amma ba'd. Brothers and sisters, I'm going to um, just take a few moments, inshallah, talk about this topic of living with courage. And tonight I'd like to mention a few people that you have never heard of. These are the real heroes, people of courage, Muslims that people don't invite to their conferences. You don't even know about them. You don't read about them. But these are the real heroes. I want to mention a young man that I had the great privilege of knowing a sixth grader named Abdul Rashid, African American Muslim in New York City, a student in the public school. He was voted the most intelligent student in school. He was the valedictorian at the graduation. And I try my best as uh, the Imam of the community when someone invites me to a graduation or or some kind of awards benefit that I try to go, so I went there. And I sat in the back. And I remember looking at this young man, maybe two or three Muslims in the entire school, and he was to give the speech. And when they called his name, I watched him as he walked down the aisle. He had a white jelly bee on white kufi and he walked so proud and he stood there and he, and he gave his talk. But what's, what was remarkable, I remember sitting way in the back and he was about to get his certificate or his, his diploma. And the person who had given uh, the talk from the district, a, a teacher, in this little scene, I remember, I'll never forget it. And uh, she would hand, hand the students the diploma and, 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 and shake their hand. And in the back, I can almost read Abdul Rashid's lips. And he said, I'm sorry, it's not permitted for me to shake the hands of women. I said, SubhanAllah. It's sixth grade. And Dr. Jamal, and you know, you and I, and, and, and uh, Sheikh Abdullah Dries, you know, we say, you know, listen, circumstances. But this young man took a lot of courage to dress the way he did to, and to make that statement. And you know what? Whatever you say about what Abdul Rashid did, the one thing that's beautiful about it you know if that man would not even touch the hand of a woman, then how easy is it for him not to commit zina? 
I remember about six years ago, a Christian woman came to the masjid, very devout Christian, and we had a, a discussion about Islam, and, and she became a Muslim, changed her name to Hanifa. And Hanifa was married to a Christian man, and, and I said, Hanifa, let's try to talk to your husband, because he was, she was very, very much in love with her husband. And she said he was a very good man. And she knew that once she became a Muslim, then she could only be married to a Muslim man. And so we had long discussions with the husband trying to convince him, and he didn't become Muslim. And without hesitation, after the time, she said, Imam, I love Allah and his messenger and this deen more than my husband. And she left him to become Muslim. And that took courage. In the last case, a young uh, woman named Stephanie, I think her name was, she worked as traffic control in Brooklyn. And she went on vacation. And when she went on vacation, she came to the Masjid of Taqwa and she became a Muslim. When she went back to work, um, after one week vacation, she put on her uniform. The only difference was that she had a kimar on. And they said, oh, no, no, you can't, you, can't, you can't wear that. She said, no, I have to wear this. This is part of my uniform. They said, no, you're you out, you out of uniform. You out of, you're not in compliance. Go home. So she went home, and the next day she went back to work again with her kimar on again. And they said, no, um, Stephanie. She said, no, Fatima. So no, Fatima, you can't wear that. She said, I have to wear it. They sent her home again. And, and she needed her money. And she called me up and I said, Fatima, don't you, don't you give in. I said, I'll go there and I'll speak to your supervisor and, and try to encourage them to allow you to dress according to your religion. And I went there and I said, I want to see the rules. And they showed me some rules. And I said, that's a matter of interpretation. Here was a woman. She was dressed, but then she had her religious garment on. Long story short, they never fired her, nor did they allow her to work. Every day, they went to this ritual. She would come to work and go for inspection in the morning. They would send her home, and the next day, she'd do the same thing. We went to court. And Allah blessed us, us. She won the case and won money. And I said, I was so happy, you know, I was telling everybody, uh, you know, Fatima, she, you know, she beat the case, and you can see her on the traffic control having her, her kimon. One day, um, Sheikh Abdullah, I was standing in front of the masjid a summer day, and I was looking outside, and uh, across the street from the masjid, there's a bus station. And I noticed a city bus came, came by. And I looked in the bus, and I was looking at the, the bus driver, and because the wind was blowing, and I see this long kimon. And guess who it was? Sister Fatima had a job as a bus driver, driving the bus of New York City. And she set some precedents in New York City with her courage. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to take a moment and to say something about courage. Courage is not something that we get from the Wizard of Oz. But yet, courage is something that we can get. With Amjad, over the years, I noticed some similarities between the black struggle, the struggle of African Americans, and the struggle of Muslims. I see a lot of similarities. I don't know if you knew that, but um, Michael Jackson used to be black. <laughs> No, really. Honest, you should, he was. No, I know him. He used to be black. That is. <laughs> no, really. His, if, if, you, if you go back, he used to have good hair. You know what good hair is? Good hair is natural hair. He had a nice nose. Now, mainly it was a little broader. And his lips were, were thick. 
And it was changed. All of that was changed. The color of the skin was changed. Everything, the, even the chin was changed. He used to be black. <laughs> and the reason I say that, brothers and sisters, if you, those of you who saw the movie Malcolm X, how many saw the movie Malcolm X? Notice in the movie Malcolm X, Denzel Washington, the one who played Malcolm, in the beginning of the movie, he had what is called conked hair. You know what conked hair was? In the, in the early 50s and early 60s, black men, many of them, would conk their hair and make their hair straight. And the reason that they made their hair straight because the society at that time conspired to make the African American feel less than a human being and make them feel inferior. <clears throat> so things that you would read in the book and make it seem like black was ugly, everything negative was black, and, and therefore black people, believe it or not, you can ask some of the African Americans who've been around for years, ask them how even black people used to put skin cream on to make their skin lighter. They will tell you because of this inferiority complex. But in the 60s, something happened. There was a cultural revolution. And in that cultural revolution, the writers, of black, black writers begin to write about the greatness and the history of black, uh, the, black, uh, the African history and black history and, and the great contributions that were made. And they had songs that sang, I'm black and I'm proud. And you notice now that black men stopped conking their hair, but they started wearing afros. I, I wish I could show you a picture. When I first became a Muslim, I had a big afro like that. I mean, my afro is so big, you can land a helicopter on it. <laughs> and then we wore daishikis. So it was an attempt now to give back to slave master what he gave us. Some of uh, my immigrant brothers may not understand why African-American men and women so often change their name. We recognize the fact that once you become Muslim, you don't have to change your name, you keep your, you keep your name. And so most of our immigrant brothers are surprised when they see uh, African-Americans become Muslim, they change their name. They don't realize that the names that we had, my name, my last name, was the name of my grandfather. And my grandfather's father was a slave. And the slave master named my great-grandfather by his name. And that's how the slave masters named their slaves, by their name. Whatever the slave master name was, they gave that name to the slave. And so that when black people became liberated and they became free, then they kept the name of their slave masters. And once we became Muslim, we said, we don't want your name no more. I'm not Jeffrey, I'm Siraj Wahaj. And so these brothers begin, Imam Jamil al Amin began to change their name, Abdullah Hakim began to change their name to Muslim names. And you will notice that in the 60s and the 70s that many parts of the, of the, of the inner cities, even non-Muslims would change their names and take black sounding names, African sounding names, Muslim names as a form of liberation. Now in my conclusion, Brothers and sisters, how do we get courage? And I'd just like to mention a, few way, uh, mention a few ways and how we can get courage. You know, those African Americans who stood up and were very happy to sing songs like I'm black and I'm proud, and, and a few of them stood up, and as a result of a few of them standing up, others began to be, become proud of themselves. Great leaders like Martin Luther King and and Malcolm X and Haj Malik Shabazz would begin to stand up and, and you know, give a sense of courage because you know, sometimes courage is contagious. And you have leaders who are strong and bold and brave and, and, and full of courage, then the, the followers become the same way. So, oh, that, lead, that leader is so brave. And so sometimes courage is contagious. Yeah. I remember also Anas ibn Malik, and whenever I hear his name, Radilan, I pay particular attention because he was always close to the Messenger of Allah, always with him. He said, I served him for 10 years, and so there are things that we learn from Anas ibn Malik that we don't learn from other people. And so when Anas ibn Malik said, Kana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul, 
that the Messenger of Allah used to say, and he used to make this dua, Allahumma inni a'udhbika min al-jubni. Allah, oh Allah, I seek refuge with you from being a coward. And this is a dua that we have to make. We seek refuge with Allah from being a coward and we want to be like Prophet Dawood alayhi salat wa salam and the Prophet said la 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 He never ran when he met, faced the enemy. And we want to be like that. We want to be like those great Sahaba. When I read with the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salat wa salam participated in 19 ghazwat, 19 battles of his life. Most of us sitting here never even been in a fight. Most of us don't know how would we respond if somebody come to attack us. But we want to be like the Messenger of Allah and those great Sahaba who fought in the great battle of Badr and the great battle of Uhud and all those great battles. Some of them gave their lives that Islam can live and they didn't run away from the battle. We're not asking you to pick up guns and we're not asking you to throw bombs at anyone. But we are asking you to be brave and to be courageous. How do you be courageous? Number one, you ask Allah for it. Seek refuge with Allah from being a coward. Number two, it is the realization that nobody, nobody can hurt you. Nobody can kill you. If it's not Allah's will. No soul can die except by the permission of Allah. It's already written in the book. Why should I be afraid? Realizing that death is going to come anyway. I will die. Every soul shall die. It may be in a plane, it could be in a, in a, in a car crash, it could be in my bed, it could be some, some sniper's bullet. You're going to die anyway. It's already written, so you might as well die like a man and like a woman. You might as well die like a believer and know that no one can hurt you except by Allah's permission. I was in Dayton, Ohio just a few days ago. Brother took me to the airport and told me, Imam Siraj, before I became a Muslim, I was shot point blank range nine times. And he lived to tell about it. And he's a Muslim today because Allah spared his life. You must realize that no one can harm you except by the permission of Allah. Don't run from the battle. Don't run. Stand there like a man. Stand there like a Muslim and defend the faith. Finally, I close with this. I, my friend, my beloved brother Salakan, he, he handed this to me and I, I thought a, a, a fitting way to end this, um, this discussion. You know, brothers and sisters, um, you know, the, really, the, the more you really understand Islam, and, and I got this from the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says that no one who dies and go to Jannah would want to come back except the Shaheed, a martyr. A person who's killed in the way of Allah. And the only reason that this martyr want to come back is to be slain ten more times in the way of Allah because of the great honor that they receive from Allah. And you know what? I believe it. The higher your iman, the higher your faith is, the more courage you have. Read about some of the great Sahaba when one of the men were uh, done before the battle was eating some, some dates and said, Ya Rasulullah, where will I be if I'm slain today? He said, you'll be in Jannah. So the man put the date to his mouth and said, wait a minute, this is going to take too long. So he threw the date down and jumped in the battle and fought until he died. And you know what, brothers and sisters, about being a person of courage? Sometimes it's more courageous to live than die. I spoke about dying and being courageous and fighting 
to defend the faith, even defend your own property. Do you know that if you fight defending your own property, you're shaheed? Yeah. Somebody come and try to take your property from you, you can fight and defend yourself. It's hadith. You can fight and defend your property. Fight and defend your family. Somebody trying to hurt your family, you go fight and defend your family, you die, you die shaheed. So, other times it's it is courage to live. There's a lot in the newspapers recently about um, mercy killing. You know, brothers and sisters, sometimes it takes real courage to live. Some, uh, Dr. Jamal mentioned in his talk about suicides. I don't know whether you know it. Every year, over 30,000 Americans try to kill, the, kill themselves because they lose courage. And sometimes it takes courage to live. You remember this, especially my young brothers and sisters, um, there's a lot of statistics that reveal that young people now are killing themselves because of the pressures of life. And you always remember this, that suicide is a permanent solution for a temporary problem. Inshallah, if you live long enough and put your faith in Allah, Allah will make it better. No matter how bad it seems, put your faith in Allah, confidence in Allah, and things will get better. And finally, I, I close with this. This is um, a quote by Brother Dr. Abdul Halim Ashka. And this was so appropriate as a man of courage that I felt that I, won't, I wanted to read it. First, I want to read uh, this statement. It says, the true measure of a man is not determined by where he stands during times of comfort and convenience, but where and how he stands during times of challenge and controversy. Now, on February 23, 1998, Dr. Abdul Halim Ashkar appeared under subpoena as a witness before a grand jury sitting in the Federal District Court of the Southern District, District of New York. Of New York. From the outset, Dr. Ashkar refused to respond to questions posed by the grand jury, invoking his Fifth Amendment privileges against self-incrimination. In an effort to compel his testimony, the government offered Dr. Ashkar use of immunity from criminal prosecution. Notwithstanding this offer, Dr. Ashgar maintained his refusal with the following explanation, and I quote, I respectfully refuse to answer any questions put to me other than my name, address, and occupation on the grounds that to do so would violate my long-held and unshakable religious, political, and personal belief, and that my answers will be used against my friends, relatives, and colleagues in the Palestinian Liberation Movement. I would rather die than betray my beliefs and commitments to freedom and democracy for Palestine. I will never give evidence or cooperate in any way with this grand jury, no matter what the consequences to me. May Allah bless him and bless us to get courage from men like that. So we will stand, and even at the risk of losing our jobs, our money, our homes, losing our reputation, at the risk of all of that, we will be courageous for Allah, and Allah will grant us a great reward. Jazakallah khairah. As-salamu alaykum wa